Subscribe to join us and our travels as we share our life on the sea. Welcome to another episode. This week we are in a little town called Daruba on the island of Moritai. Daruba is the island's largest town located on the island's south coast. This is Anna and she's offered to show us around. So we hired a car, piled in and went for a drive. Nice to meet you too. After COVID, you first time. Yes, first visitors. Okay. Yes, welcome to Moroccan. You're my husband. Oh, that's your husband? Nice to meet you. Irham. It's your baby? Nice to meet yes, you. Yes, my baby. <laughs> Baby name MG. 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 Yeah. Uh, Mukti Gipari. Uh -huh. But uh, MG. MG just short. MG. Short, short names. Uh, MG. Uh, my husband Irham. Irham. In early 1944, Moritai became an area of importance to the Japanese military. This island became the airfield for the Japanese during the World War II. The Battle of Moritai, part of the Pacific War began on 15th of September 1944 and continued until August 1945. The fighting started when the United States and the Australian forces landed on the southwest corner of Moritai. The invading forces greatly outnumbered the island's Japanese defenders and secured their objectives in two weeks. Japanese reinforcements landed on the island between September and November but lacked the supplies needed to effectively attack the Allied defence perimeter. Intermittent fighting continued until the end of the war with the Japanese troops suffering heavy loss of life from disease and starvation. Then the island was taken over by the force of United States in September 1944 and being used as a basis for the Allied attack to the Philippines in early 1945. And today Anna is walking us around where the American and Australian troops once landed all these years ago. In Morotai, the Higila, Pinunjela, and then some people from America and Australia bring to gun until to here. Okay. Rot, 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 rot. Yeah. And until to here. If uh, uh, water is low. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, they walk from that walk island. From that island to that one. Wow. There's some army is uh, bring to the gun. Uh, road until to here, away until. And they walk the guns on low tide all the way to this island. Oh. Ah, that's cool. yeah. Is that the island? Uh, the, maybe grandpa and grandma is long time have uh, talked with about to uh, Australia and America. Now the, the traditional people, uh, local here, no book book no. Just Japan and the local people always to. You know, to sometimes speak. Oh. You, uh, Japanese uh, and Japan local people uh, fight. Fight. And but Australia but and America? Uh, and no, local not, people? No, no fight. Friends. It's very long time. Yes. Very long time ago. Yeah. <laughs> we continue to stop at some World War II sites, this being a cemetery for troops that lost their lives here in the battle. This is one of the seven army docks that was built for the ships. Here is four and there. Seven army docks. Seven army docks, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Don't give us a thumbs down. Don't tell people to give us a thumbs down. <laughs> While we're here learning all about the history of World War II, the kids were reminiscing on ice creams from Australia. Oh, these donuts are bloody amazing. <laughs> so you can buy four donuts? For 50 cents? Yeah. And you did? So we got 10. <laughs> Can't afford not to. <laughs> At least these ones you don't get the nose hair stuck in the sugar. <laughs> if everyone I've, hasn't noticed been... yet, it's been trimming. I <laughs> oh, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> don't run away. <laughs> don't leave your baby. <laughs> oh, I 
off that sand? What's this place? Oh, there's a tank. It does not. Yeah, amphibian. Really? So it's a like a tank and a boat. Oh yeah, it kind of looks like a boat. And then it goes along the ground too. A little bit rusty. How old would this be? 1930. Wow. An amphibious tank. Amphibious, which means yeah. it goes in the water and on the land. Oh, like the aqueduct thing. Like an aqueduct. Is that what it's called? Yeah, I think that's like. That, obviously. Yeah, that's what they call the aqueduct. <laughs> and this is the aqueduct, a tour boat slash bus in Australia. <laughs> this is an aqueduct from 1930. <laughs> you found money. Yeah, I'm never that lucky. Oh. All day long you have good luck. <laughs> Very much uh pain. One, two again there. And uh, maybe four and the six tank amphibie here but uh, in the long time the woman from Jakarta name is Nona Herlina yeah. come to Morotai and say to the tank for bring to Jakarta for this oh. Oh, scrap so for the iron. scrap metal it's better like my face you don't like your face that's a horrible <laughs> thing to say I love your face your face is the best. Imagine the sound of that though when it goes through. Like when it hits it. Firing at you. No, no, so. That would be scary. Oh, look, there's more. So these would have been, I reckon some of these That one must have come from outside because the stuff's out. Like they shot. I wonder if they put the gun holes like. It's an amphibious tank. Initially, this tank was used as a means of transporting soldiers and logistics from warships to shorelines where they were attacked. But later, this tank was armed with two to three machine guns and even cannons. So this tank became a combat combat vehicle that could play a role as well as protect the reserve. Boom. Yeah, Google Translate. <laughs> That's what the sign says. This one, this is a big one. Why do they do that? Protection. Yeah. She's like, you guys are very simple. Yeah, show this to all the vegans. Look at this. This thing's just as alive as... Uh, if uh, some people is sick, it is... So uh, yeah. What's its name again? Uh, Putri Malu. Putri Malu. Putri Malu. Oh, Malu Shai. Ah, uh, yes. Putri Malu, but... Uh, Shai Princess. Alright, so we're at a monument for a Japanese soldier. A World War II ended here in Maritai in 1945. This guy was uh, found wandering in the bush in 1974, so 27 years later. Which is crazy! He was just wandering around thinking the war was still going on, probably hiding. And uh, then one day he realised that it was all over. He got shipped back to Taiwan, Japan. And that is the story. I think he died another uh, 10 years later. Yeah. So he lived for another so 10 years, 10 but uh, then he died. He'd have been like in his 20s, oh, early 20s. He lived another four years. Oh, he only lived four he years. Drafted. He was yeah. disappointed. He liked his life here probably. He lived a long time in the jungle. He's actually Taiwanese, half Taiwanese, half Japanese. And uh, that's all I know about this guy. But imagine that. Imagine like thinking that the war was happening and then like for 27 years and realizing that it ended that long ago. Anyway, crazy story. This is him right here. Good looking man. Is he still alive? 
Right. No, he died. So they, they um, Ali just cleared it up. They didn't just find him wandering in the jungle. They were building a little bit of, of a community. I think there must have been a few of um, a few soldiers. Oh, and Lee may have made that up too. So I'm not really sure, guys. Sorry. If you'd like to look it up, Google Moritai and World War II. There's something about this dude. <laughs> His name was Teru Nakamura and he was the last of the last of the World War II holdouts. Nakamura refused to believe the war had ended and lived in a tiny hut on Indonesia's Moritai Island until he was discovered in 1974. By the 1970s, World War II had been over for nearly three decades. Young soldiers had returned home, started families and entered middle age. But on December 18th, 1974, news broke that one man had never gotten the memo of the war's end. The Japanese soldiers fought hard, but they were vastly outnumbered and suffered heavy casualties. Many of the remaining men surrendered to the Allied troops, but some retreated into the thick jungle interior of the island. Nakamura's unit had been commanded to conduct guerrilla warfare in such circumstances. He later disclosed my commanding officer told me to fight it out, so that's what he did. Over the next few months, many of the remaining members of the Japanese army were captured, surrendered or died of disease or starvation, but Nakamura remained with a small group of stragglers, determined to continue following the commands even though they had no way to communicate with the outside world. With no record of Nakamura's surrender, Render, the Japanese army declared him dead on November 13th, 1944. It would be 30 years before his family learned the truth. Nakamura survived by eating bananas and fishing in the island's waters. Nakamura lived with several other Japanese soldiers on Moritai Island for 12 years. Since they had lost radio contact with their commanders, they had no idea the war had ended. When leaflets were dropped over the island in 1945 declaring that Japan had surrendered and the war was over, Nakamura and his comrades dismissed them as enemy propaganda. Nakamura later told the Taipei Times that he believed the war was still ongoing due to the planes that were constantly flying over the island. As the planes became more modern, he assumed there was an army arms race occurring between the Allied and Axis powers. In reality, there was an Indonesian Air Force base nearby and he was seeing daily practice flights. In 1956, Nakamura left his fellow troop and set off on his own, some say because the other men tried to kill him. He built a small hut in a field and survived by growing sweet potatoes and eating bananas off trees. He entertained himself by fishing and fiddling with an abacus he made. He cooked only when it was dark so enemies wouldn't see the smoke from his fire. Nakamura counted the days that passed by observing the moon cycles, and he kept track of the months and years by tying knots in a rope. I calmly stayed alive there, he later said. Although I didn't have anyone to talk to, buried deep in my heart seemed to be a glimmer of hope and expectation. The only trace of happiness during this time came from the fact that I was still alive and I hadn't lost my sense of existence yet. Nakamura continued, not to lose my life became my only goal and that exhausted almost all of my time. In November 1974, the Indonesian government was informed that there may be a holdout from a Japanese army then 55 years old emerged. He was naked and exhausted, but in surprisingly good health. Indonesian authorities then sent him back to Taiwan to be reunited with his family. When Nakamura returned home, he realized how much had changed. For the next four years, Nakamura lived quietly and peacefully with his family. On June 15, 1979, he lost his final battle, this time to lung cancer. Despite spending nearly half of his life in isolation, Nakamura left behind a legacy of a brave man and a dedicated soldier. Right, we're at a museum. Wow, look at these flowers. You are like Nemo. <laughs> <laughs> that were pretty. We're at a World War II museum. It's a private, it's a private museum with really pretty hibiscus flowers all around the outside. <laughs> and a really cute little girl. Hello. <laughs> Are they? Yeah. Is it really? Oh, they don't want them. When they see the clip out of it, that's when they. The what? Oh, really? Do they really? Yeah. Oh, so when it's got a little thing out of the side, that means that person died. Yeah. Are you talking crap? Oh my god, I believe oh you. I've like. It was believable. It was really believable. Don't take any information off what either anyone says on this video. <laughs> Sí.
San Francisco, California. Yeah. 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 A lunchbox. Yeah. Money. Welcome to a one-man World War II museum. The owner, Moulis Esso, preserving history before it was sold off. And remember, this guy dug most of these oh, things the out of the ground himself. Yeah. Pretty cool. Dodgy. Why? Good. How did they? How did they not blow up? I might still be fine. Because you wouldn't know. Is that helmet? It's a bit busted. <laughs> before they bomb, like before. Yeah. Yeah. So loud. Informasi. Informasi Japanese. Yeah. Uh, from the Japanese. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah. How do I hold this right? One, I was in one, two, yeah, three. Yeah. How would that be, Belle? Carrying yeah. that and a gun and having heavy clothes on moving around in the bush. Yeah. Pretty hard. Well, this is heavier than I thought it would be. Is that heavy? <laughs> the helmet's heavy too. <laughs> <laughs> Can you walk for now? That's not mine. <laughs> 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 oh, like oh, oh, Rambo! Rambo! Oh, you actually look good. Bang, 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 that's sort of like a personal collection here. Um, I'd say this has just accumulated over the years. I've seen the book. People have been signing it since 2010. So he's been going for a little while here with his personal collection. Different size helmets. Oh, yeah. oh, okay. 
Mm-hmm. Dan ini ada perbedaan dengan ini, perbedaan dengan itu cara pembuatan juga dia ada beda. Different brands. Okay. Mm. Uh, It was really interesting seeing this private museum. Esso was very passionate about all the relics and it made it pretty cool knowing that he had dug up most of them himself. Thank you Esso for having us and showing us around. Esso's family also supplies coconut charcoal to Jakarta and makes coconut oil. But if you uh, if uh, you want made here, it's there. It's a fire and the clouds yeah. cannot do water here. Days like these last with one another. They're making coconut oil here, and it takes two days to make the coconut oil. With the feeling. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mr. If it all starts. Because I am going tomorrow time. Thank you so much. Yeah, this is Anna. If you do come to Morotai, um, we can get you in contact with her and she can show you around. She's awesome and Morotai is really cool to come visit, so. We ended the day with some basketball. Sometimes you gotta sleep with your own eyes. Oh, here it is. Oh, geez, the sidelines. I'm just, um, I'm just um, trying to touch my inner child. Get on in touch. <laughs> <laughs> wow, <laughs> Basketball injury. <laughs> oh, don't rip that. I'd cut it. Okay. Yeah, I'd cut it. Playing barefoot wasn't such a great idea, Taj. Cheers, everyone. <laughs>